I thought I would uh, start with what is essentially reminiscences because I was actually a member of, as a uh, PhD student, a member of uh, Carl Polanyi's famous seminar at Columbia University on trade and markets in early empires, which featured, among other people, a certain uh, assistant professor from Rutgers on the run from the McCarthy Committee named Moses Finley. Uh, the, the next time I saw Moses Finley, I was walking down, uh, I think it must have been the street right here, King, King Street, uh, and, uh, and I was hailed from behind by a man in a gown. <laughs> who took me up to his room to have sherry. And this was a great advantage, a great advance over his, uh, over his, uh, situ his situation as a fugitive, essentially, uh, an academic fugitive in, in America. Anyhow, uh, Polanyi, uh, in this seminar was a long time ago, I won't even, something like the Upper Paleolithic period, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> Polanyi at that time uh, used to dwell on a, a certain distinction he made between what he called economics one and economics two. Economics being di two different definitions of the economy, uh, which he uh, said were unfortunately conflated and which conflation was a source of great misunderstanding about the nature of economic science. Uh, economics one was the notion of individual economizing, that uh, the economy consists of individuals who maximize their scarce resources uh, against alternative ends to derive the greatest possible satisfaction. The, the definition you can find in, in almost any economics textbook for the last 150 years. Uh, this, uh, for uh, Polanyi, uh, obfuscated the fact that there was, that the economy really was a social phenomenon, uh, and what he considered as economics too, uh, was the material, what, what Veblen in the quote I have here called material civilization and its relationship to other phases and bearings of the culture complex. In other words, the way a society provisioned itself materially. A, a, a social fact, a social phenomenon, uh, um, which had to do with the organization of material life in a society as an expression of the order of the society, culturally speaking. Uh, the problem was that economists reduced, for uh, 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 at least the problem was, as Polanyi saw it, was the economists reduced uh, the nature of the economy, or the economy as a social fact, to the economy as an individual economizing fact. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time criticizing economists, because uh, everybody does that, and uh, moreover, it gets nowhere. Uh, I mean, this uh, notion that this is, these are uh, zombie economic ideas that refuse to die is perfectly correct. Uh, they have had stakes driven through their heart time and time again, and they seem to just go on. I think it would be an interesting question for discussion to ask why that happens. Uh, Polanyi's answer, I think, was that uh, the bush was subjectivity, as we say these days. That is the way that the, uh, the economy appears to the experience of those who are participating in it is that the people are themselves determining it by their choices. When you have a choice of, say, visiting your grandchildren in California or uh, uh, buying a new car. Uh, now, whether or not cars will be bought or, or uh, the grandchildren will be valued or uh, some, other, uh, some other use of the, your, your resources will, will, will take place uh, will determine whether those things exist in the society. Uh, consequently, it seems to you, uh, as a member of this society, that in fact, uh, how the society is culturally constituted is a function of your choices. 
Uh, and since uh, there's no going behind consumers' choices, which would be the real problem, I mean, why these things are of value or relative value, uh, it, uh, without going behind any but his choices, it seems like these choices are sedimenting the way the culture is organized. So the normal experience, our normal experience, since everything is for sale, and that's a fundamental condition, and Polanyi used to, uh, uh, used to, to emphasize it, since everything is for sale and what's not for sale can be rented, uh, <laughs> then the whole of the world is at the, your disposition uh, in terms of a monetary uh, choice among all different possible satisfactions. That being the case, it seems from our ordinary experience that the world is constructed that way and therefore uh, this kind of notion that the economy is, consists of economizing, that economy two is economy one, uh, is a normal, uh, a normal character of our experience. <clears throat> Polanyi himself, however, had a weak moment, which I discuss in this paper on pages 14 and 15, um, <clears throat> which if you don't mind, I'll refer to because it's been some time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what, I, what, what I call his weak moment is his notion that at a certain time that the self-regulating market uh, organized simply by these choices, uh, 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 freed itself totally from economic constraints and became uh, a totally automatic thing in itself uh, and indeed uh, dominated uh, the society rather than being dominated by the society. Uh, this page, as I say on page 14 and 15, as he put it, the commodity fiction, he said, handed over the fate of man and nature to the play of, of an automaton that ran in its own grooves and was governed by its own laws. This instrument of material welfare was controlled solely by the incentives of hunger and gain, that is, by the incentives of scarcity, hunger and gain. Uh, I say this is a weak moment because Otherwise, uh, Polanyi argued that the economy was embedded in a larger society, uh, a word that he used very commonly and often embedded uh, before its uh, Iraqi man manifestation. <laughs> uh, it was embedded in a larger economy and in a larger society, and and it was that set of social relations that uh, fundamentally organized what people were doing with their material goods. But at a certain moment, he thought, the economy freed itself. It became a self-regulating, perfectly free market, which was organized solely by hunger and gain. Obviously, though, the problem is uh, that hunger and gain have no absolute definition. Uh, and what is hunger, greed, and gain, as he used, uh, as he often uh, uh, used the terms? Now, uh, what are hunger, greed, and gain are historically and relatively uh, determine. Uh, you know, what one man's hunger is not another's. You know, one man's satisfaction of hunger is not another, uh, not alone one woman's satisfaction of hunger not being another. Uh, and consequently, uh, what he did when he, uh, as it were, lapsed into the ideology of the free market economy was abandon his notion of economy too. Uh, <clears throat> so it seems to me uh, that we have a problem uh, which uh, by examining uh, uh, this lapse of Polanyi's, I think we can come to a better understanding of what is entailed in the economy. And what is entailed is not that the economy is embedded as if the rest of the society were something different from economics as if economics itself was not itself a cultural fact, but some sort of extra material fact. And of course, that is uh, one of the problems of the, econ of the economics as, as constituted, namely that the rest of the rest of the society is considered to be non-economic. And the argument I make in the paper, of course, is 
uh, that these so-called non-economic factors uh, are the things that are determining the material life of the society, and consequently they are not external and not, it is not that the economy is embedded in something different. Rather, it is obvious to me, and I think obviously true, that the utility values that people have, that is to say their, the values that are expressed in their material choices, are differential cultural values. And differential cultural values are meaningful values. Um, so contrary to my uh, esteemed colleague, Eric Hemp, who often told me, don't be so sure, <laughs> uh, differential meaningful values are, of course, uh, uh, differential cultural values are, of course, meaningful values. And, uh, and it is a set of meaningful values that lies behind uh, the utility choices, so that the pecuniary values are, in fact, an expression of a set of meaningful values of the society. And I tried to argue this uh, in this paper on page 15 and 16 with regard to food, to clothing, clothing food, and so on. Uh, for example, I, in clothing, uh, it's not, uh, the, the, the people's choices in clothing depend upon who they are, what they're doing, what the occasion is, whether it's Sunday or a weekday, whether it's an evening or a morning, whether you're a man or a woman, uh, whether you're going into sport or you're going to a formal dinner, all these f things are what determines what is a relevant form of utility in the terms of a material value, and consequently, what is a relevant expenditure of your uh, pecuniary resources to acquire it. So behind the set of utility values, of pecuniary values, of prices, is a whole set of meaningful values of which we are not necessarily conscious. We tend to be conscious of them in a way that Bourdieu called habitus, that is to say in profile. Like I know that, for example, long hair is to short hair, as swinging is to not so swinging, uh, is to straight, or uh, that, uh, that filet mignon is, uh, is to hamburger as dinner is to lunch. Uh, or as an honorable meal is to an ordinary meal. Uh, but uh, beyond that, we don't have a whole sense generally of the, whole, of the set of values that's, that's being, or, that's being uh, realized in, in, our, uh, in our economic choices. Uh, uh, but, but what I'm trying to say about it is that precisely there are these values which are values of persons and of the objects of their existence and of occasions of which of the, in which uh, these material things are used, which are determining uh, the choices on the, in the realm of the market. So the market then, unlike Polanyi's notion that it was free, the market is a representation in terms of the distribution, the price and distribution of goods of a certain state of the social cultural order. It is a realization in the form of object, an objective form of uh, the state of the, co the social and cultural order. <coughs> uh, it is a, uh, the utility values are, as I say, differential cultural values. Uh, and here I say the way evening gowns are distinguished from little daytime dresses, the way suits are distinguished from overalls, uniforms from mufti, silk from denim, and these are related to differences in status, class, place, occasions of use, gender, time of day, and so forth. So that the market is thus a medium of cultural order, an expression of a cultural order, and not, uh, as Polanyi had it in his weakest moment, the determinant of the cultural order. Because hunger and gain are not, and are only abstract phenomena when you put them into the reality of anybody's existence they become certain cultural values. Um, so that's, that's uh, my general view of, uh, of the problems of economics. Uh, now, uh, uh, 
most of the paper and most of the uh, two papers, in fact, are associated are devoted to a particular type of, of question of value, namely the question of the superiority of goods from the outside. Uh, the the uh, argument is based on a, a sense of human finitude, as uh, as as it's explained, especially in the second paper, the notion that, in fact, no, the, the the human predicament generally is that no society, no people, uh, controls its own uh, life and death. If we controlled our own lives, we wouldn't die. Uh, we wouldn't get sick. Uh, we wouldn't. We 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 would. Our crops would would uh, would be bountiful, and our situation generally would be much better than it is. So it's obvious that for any society, the conditions of its existence are not within its own power, uh, and it is. Uh, and and it, and and that life and death, the fundamental conditions thereof, come from outside the socius outside the organization of the society. Uh, and what I try to show in these two papers is that the fundamental riches of the society embody these life powers and are appropriated from the outside and that they constitute the higher relations of society, the reproductive activity of society, and uh, the hierarchical order of politics of the society. Uh, and that is because uh, these goods from, and I use ethnography from all over the world, and from all over the world, these goods, interestingly enough, involve animate qualities, uh, life-giving animate qualities. Um, I, I quote, for example, Sidney Howell's uh, discussion of gold in Flores, uh, in, in Indonesia, uh, where she talks about the fact that life inheres in Flores gold, not inertly, but as a communicable force, and in that way it becomes an appropriate uh, good in affinal exchanges. And this, incidentally, is uh, very common, that affinal exchanges almost always involve external goods because they are in fact involved in the reproduction of life. From this it also follows, you might notice, that, uh, that uh, the riches, uh, although they are often called primitive monies or in mo Moses terms magical property, are not inimical to kinship relations, but they are the means of fashioning them. Uh, insofar as they inv are involved in an exchange uh, between uh, ethnal uh, relations which constitute larger systems of relation in the society. Anyhow, uh, uh, Sidney Howell writes that gold is acquired no notably in ethnal exchanges by wife givers, and so it's in return for the transfer of women's reproductive powers between patrilineal groups. And this, as I say, is a common use of foreign-derived wealth, the world, the anthropological world around. <clears throat> and it also suggests that the original money uses were social payments and stores of life value. Uh, and it is these kinds of money uses which are, in fact, fundamental to kinship rather than being inimical to kinship. Uh, <clears throat> as Howell relates, life inheres in Flores gold not inertly, she says, but as a communicable force. Gold is not inanimate. It is imbued with life force, a life force which is as necessary for the recreation of life processes as rice and women. Gold in itself has a potency of a life-promoting kind. Gold alone, among things in the Leo world, shows no sign of aging. Its shine continues through the ages. I suggest there's a conceptual link between red gold, which is the most valuable kind, blood, and women, which together adds to the significance of gold as the vital part of alliance exchanges. Gold and women rice, women slash rice, constitute each other within the semantic flow, domain of the flow of life. <coughs> uh, 
So the argument is that embodying fundamental life powers from the outside, the riches of many societies around the world, are, uh, are externally derived. And that this is uh, fundamental also not only in marital exchanges, but in the politics of the society's concern. I, I, uh, I, uh, let me illustrate the latter point uh, from this uh, citation from uh, James Scott about uh, the hill settlements of Southeast Asia because it connects with the lecture I gave or the discussion we had last, uh, yesterday. He writes that even in the most remote hill settlements, one encounters symbols of the authority and tokens of power that seem to flood up in fragments from the valley states. Robes, hats, ceremonial staffs, scrolls, copies of court architecture, verbal formulas, bits of court ritual. There is hardly any claim to extra village authority in the hills that does not imply some cosmopolitan trapping to enhance its assertion of authority. In other words, what I called yesterday galactic mimesis. The hill people have the structures of the people in the plains uh, who are uh, more highly organized. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and this, because these uh, highly organized uh, peoples and their goods uh, represent to the hill people life-enhancing values. Now, I won't go to, through all these examples, but in the case of Palau, uh, which uh, appears in the, both of these, uh, are, uh, both of these uh, papers, uh, th there's a long discussion of the constitution of the structures of society and their immunization against contingency uh, by, uh, the, uh, dis by the disposition of foreign monies which themselves have been voided of historical uh, origin except for their provenience, but not for the time or how they got there or anything of that sort. On the contrary, they're usually identified with celestial phenomena. <coughs> uh, finally, uh, let me uh, uh, talk about three aspects of these papers which I think produce uh, an unusual understanding of uh, the world of, of anthropology and history. One is the notion, which I derived from Godelier's work, that, uh, that value ha being determined by its external provenience, uh, scarcity then is a function of value rather than value of scarcity. In our own economies, uh, the, and, and in economic science, the argument, of course, is that a value is a function of scarcity. But if value is a function of alterity, then it is necessarily scarce. So that scarcity becomes a function of value, not the other way around in the societies that we're dealing with. It's because they have external provenience and that these and that they are endowed with animate qualities that these goods are valued uh, and uh, and they are uh, necessarily then scarce there being um, distance the second point that's rather interesting comes from my critique of levi strauss's notions of totemism which as you will recall is a notion basically of an intellectual sort in which he argues that the totemism is fundamentally a way of classifying peoples uh, and that the difference between totem A and totem B is a way of representing the difference between society, group A and group B that are respectively associated with the totem. <laughs> that, that might be true, but what, uh, what, it, what is also then true is a rather startling fact that the difference between two groups of the same societies is a difference of species. Uh, and this is all the remark more than remarkable because we're dealing with societies which are relatively simple societies, like the Australian Aboriginals, or uh, the other case I spent the more time on in this paper, the Manambu and other Sepik River uh, peoples. Uh, and their totemic systems. These totemic systems are interesting for two things, actually. One is that in these systems, 
people do not generally eat their own totems, that's taboo. Uh, they generally are responsible for the production of their totems on behalf of everybody else. So instead of a society, as Hobbes would have it, where every man is uh, against every man, here's a society where every man gives himself to every man, that is every group gives themselves to every group, all the more so because Lady Strauss notwithstanding, there is a substantial relation between the totem and species and the, and the group that has it as a totem. They are kinsmen or they are descended from, one is descended, the people are descended from the totem. And that being the case, one gives one's own substance to other people. In, so here's the society that in principle is based on an organic division of labor between groups that are respectively producing themselves for each other. It's quite the opposite from a Hobbesian state of nature. Uh, now, uh, the, the other aspect of this which I'm stressing uh, is that it is a society composed of people of different species, uh, which is rather the opposite of nationalism, but it's also the opposite of um, of, of the Durkheimian notion that the simple societies are organized by mechanical solidarity. Mechanical solidarity being the solidarity of people who are all alike and therefore behave in the same way with regard to the same circumstances. Uh, Durkheim's notion of the organic division of labor was that it was of a highly organized contractual society such as ours. But in fact, uh, the, uh, an organic division of labor on a cosmic scale is characteristic of some of the most simple societies we know and that they are fundamentally constituted by difference. This leads me to the third point I want to make, which is, uh, and I quote Hocart here in one of my, uh, what I call a Cartesian meditation, a whole Cartesian meditation. Uh, which I think is one of the, um, for me, a key uh, passage in all of anthropology, where he talks about the fact that men divide themselves into two groups in order that they may impart life to one another, that they may intermarry, compete with one another, make offerings to one another, and to do to one another whatever is required by their theory of prosperity. Uh, that being the case, if that's the case, then difference is not a simple natural process of differentiation. It is a kind of cultural intention. And it is a cultural intention which is at the basic to the organization of society as a collation of complementary parts. <coughs> and I think that this is what the, uh, what totemism, you know, when, if you reverse the perspective and say, you know, it's not so, it's, it's very interesting, yeah, that, that people, and Levi Strauss says it at one point, are different, as different biologically as species are different in the same society. Uh, so I, uh, I, there are two, uh, of this last point, there are two implications. One, I spell out using, um, uh, using uh, Ted Schwartz's, Theodore Schwartz's, material on the Admiralty Islands, where he shows at great length uh, uh, that they're, uh, they're involved in what he calls at various points, cultural speciation. That the various groups differentiate themselves with regard to each other in a process that uh, creates a relationship between them by their difference. It's not that they were different and then they got together. It's that they got together and became different. Uh, and I quote Levi Strauss incidentally, positively at the, in that point about a famous uh, text from uh, his little book on race where he says that the differences between society are more a function of their relationship than of their separation. <coughs> uh, and, uh, and this is uh, uh, reinforced in, uh, in, the, in the Ted Schwartz's case by uh, what he uh, more, more or less specifically describes as a serious attempt 
to maintain a difference and create a difference even between people which are, who are uh, close to each other and in similar environments. And finally he uh, points out something that's very commonly known to Melanesianists, namely that, me that there is a great deal of specialization of production that's based on proprietary rights of individuals and groups that has nothing to do with economic opportunities or ecological differences, that it is based upon and it creates uh, a relation of interdependence between people within and between societies uh, based on the creation of a of, of difference as a value of, uh, of solidarity. Uh, so that leads me to my last and most radical point, I suppose, that I don't think that the Taylorian formula uh, that uh, that uh, we used to explain incest taboo, namely that people had the choice in the earliest times of marrying out or dying out, which incidentally presupposes a Hobbesian condition of nature rather than a Australian or Sepik River condition of interrelations. Uh, I don't. I don't think that that was really the origin of the incest taboo. I think the origin of the incest taboo, if I can quote it again, is that men divide themselves into two groups in order that they may impart life to one another. Because they can't, you know, you've got to find some place where you're going to get life because we don't control it. Men divide themselves into two groups in order that they may impart life to one another, that they may intermarry compete with one another, he's got his own notion of the development of the incest, to make offerings to one another and do to one another whatever is required by their theory of prosperity. Uh, so, so my argument is that uh, the incest taboo itself is a, an aspect of the cultural creation of difference, which is, which is a fundamental condition of the solidarity of society. Uh, as the Maori say, <laughs> <laughs>